hands on your on your chair. So let's all grab the pen. The pen. And we're going to start with a math, a math question. So the math question is this. In the span of your lifetime, how many weeks have you spent in classrooms? So if you're to add up all the weeks that you've spent in classrooms as a student, how many weeks do you think that might be? A little brain, a little brain. It can be ballpark. There's not a right answer. Everybody's got a different answer to this question. How many weeks in a year? How many weeks in a year? So we'll start with that. 52. <laughs> so once you have a sense of you know how many weeks, uh, we're all going to write it together in, in the air. So I just want to give a sense. So on count of three, one, two, three, write the number. Ballpark. Okay. So you notice the pens are moving for a long time. A lot of our life is spent in classrooms. A lot of our time is spent in classrooms. And as a result, there's this sociological phenomenon that happens where we are experts in learning. We're experts in our experience in classrooms. So grab the pen again, and um, we're going to do another quick exercise here. So we can all draw a circle clockwise on the ceiling. <clears throat> so drawing that circle clockwise, and Keep it clockwise, and we're going to bring it down below your belly button without stopping it. And then look at, look at it. Is it still clockwise? <laughs> okay, try it again. Try it again. Don't move it. So what's happening here? Like, keep it going. Don't stop it. Moving it. What's that? We just shifted our perspective. <laughs> so it's going counterclockwise. And so this is kind of an embodied slide. I don't have slide decks. But clockwise, you know, this is what happens in education. Our perspective is very, very um, uh, influenced by our thousands of hours, hundreds of weeks in classrooms. And we're steeped in this version of the education system. It's our perspective, but it's also the way that the education system is talked about in the media. Those who can't teach. School kills creativity. Gosh, I wouldn't complain so much if I had every summer off. Right? There's a lot, there's a lot that we're steeped in. So I invite you for the next you know, five or six minutes that I have, just, just to come on a journey with me where you actually look at the system from a different perspective. And the other perspective that I'm steeped in is the perspective of teachers. And it is another view on the system. And there's such rich abundance of creativity in what teachers do, what great teachers do. But we're just more inclined to value creativity in the professions that we're not so collectively immersed in. Now, let me be clear, I'm not denying <laughs> that here, the story that we're steeped in, is an abundance of pain, an abundance of systemic injustice, abuses of power, fundamentally flawed colonial and imperialist design, and really a traditional education system that's being held together by duct tape, chewing gum, and spit. So I know that. But just take a few minutes to look from a creative perspective. Because within this very bound and broken structure, there really is profound inspiration in the acts that teachers do. So let's fill the room with them. Every one of us is here today because we have a teacher, a community elder, a family member, a guide, a mentor that has helped us. So on the count of three, we're just going to yell their names out in the air because that's who we're going to be talking about today. So one, two, three. Miss Milanovich. There we are. I teach. It's my creative act, and I study teachers, observing their work with groups of people in the way that one might study an artist. An artist has a craft, a calling, an artist enacts their work with a trained, rigorous wisdom, and all of these people that you just called out their names are artists. So I'm very curious in my work about surfacing the names and the unique perspectives and tools and techniques and stories of these great teachers in the same way that we do with other professions that we call creative. Architects, musicians, dancers. And there's three really radical creative acts that I see great teachers do. 
One is that they know they're in this. And so they are actively, radically breaking habits every single day. They're trying to bust the story of what should happen in these classrooms and create spaces where people can really thrive. So if we are sitting in a room with a group and we ask the group, what does academic look like? Most people will take very like frozen positions and really mm, like this, right? Like, like the frozen images, like mm, mm, academic. And when people think what academic is supposed to be, they become very disembodied and very unhappy looking, right? And there's a lot of pointer fingers and laptops. When we also think about the habits of socialization and we ask people to make images of what they think social looks like, it becomes very embodied and lively and a lot of energy and a lot of connection and a lot of looking at other people. So really great teachers know that these two things have to dance together, right? And that they need to bust out of these systems that tell us what academic is supposed to look like, which is false, <laughs> and actually bring the body and the heart and, the, and the, all aspects of how we learn into that space. And that's not easy when the world is telling us that rigor and academic is supposed to look a certain way. Great teachers also are radically curious about their medium. So much like artists have a medium of paintbrushes or writing tools uh, or blueprints, great teachers have mediums. And one of the mediums they have is the rooms that they work in. And so many classrooms are very much steering us towards a particular way of being in the room. So when I walk into a classroom, the first thing I ask myself is, what does this room want us to do? Because the room itself is the medium that I have to play with. And then I need to get really creative in how I move the room into different configurations to actually be able to bring the community together the way that I need to. Great teachers also radically invite a co-creative process. So students in their classrooms are creating the spaces with them. It's a collaborative effort. And they know that every single one of us, no matter what age and stage we're at, when we walk into a room with a cafeteria tray, we really hope somebody invites us to sit with them. We have that feeling our whole life. And the way brain development works, nobody has that feeling stronger and more intensely than somebody between the ages of 12 and 24. Right? And so that invitation to co-create in the classroom space is really um, an invitation to have a place of belonging and a place of connection and community and collective meaning making. And the teachers that do that well are phenomenal. So I'm gonna end by just asking you to imagine that those who teach create. And those who create magic are really amazing sources of creative inspiration. They create beauty, they create connection, they create opportunity. But you know, it's actually not magic. They didn't wake up one day to do that. It's studied, it's thoughtful, it's designed, it's musical, it's choreographed, it's collaged, it's crafted, it's coded, it's built, you know, like the rigor of all great artists. And it's done every single time, every single day, for many of us, eight hours a day. And we walk into the room, and when we have to create eight hours a day, we really carry the weight of the system with us. And it's a very active reframing. So my invitation to you is to think about that perspective, but also the next time you go to a dinner party or any kind of event and you find yourself seated next to a teacher, ask them questions the way that you would ask questions of an architect or an artist or a chef. And as creatives, you're going to be able to tell by the way they answer those questions if there's something that you can be inspired by and learn from. Uh, and I think that you'll have an amazing conversation if you find the people that really think about their work creatively. And I promise you, you may be one of the only people who's ever asked them those questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marga. Uh, I've been a volunteer with Creative Morning Set and Death Scan for around 18 years. So I feel like I'm a, you know, a professional volunteer. Gotta say, right? So 
<laughs> so yeah, I'm, I've been volunteering for Desconnect Trade Mornings, um, and I, I've seen uh, this opportunity um, as, to talk about abundance as an opportunity to kind of, you know, make sense of what I want to say, right? And there's so much that you can talk on abundance of all things. So it's kind of a, you know, not situation to be here talking about a subject that I actually have experience in abundance, which is uh, generosity. And the generosity of, you know, this community and how it has different ways in how it gets expressed and, and takes shape. So for example, we always see abundance of a lot of effort and hard work. And you can see it here right now. Like there's hundreds of people behind the scenes donating hundreds of hours to build this community, right? To go through meetings and emails and connect with speakers and partners and hours on social media and email newsletters and you know doing slides for our presentations. Uh, hundreds of phone calls uh, and Zoom meetings. So everything is, uh, you know, there's a lot of going on to get this going. So the mountain of hours it takes to produce these events and these videos and these photos, uh, you know, um, we have multiple planning sessions and audio setups and, you know, installations that work for the, for the video, uh, simultaneous Zoom meetings, lighting setups, uh, just the chairs that we're all sitting here, uh, cooking and prepping the breakfast, brewing the coffee, getting you in the, the room, all of that needs hard work. And, uh, and all that hard work and effort shows in big and small tasks that uh, takes, you know, to make this happen. And, and we get this over and over for the last 11 plus years that we've been here. And it's a constant reminder of the abundance of generosity from all the people that are involved. Also part of that hard work um, invested is that we can include the insane amount of creativity that we see in each of these activities. Like, you know, of course, we, it's creative mornings, right? That is the theme of what, of what we're here. But if you think of the abundance of the talented humans behind the cameras, behind the, the mics, behind the, the things that are actually happening, and uh, you know we, that makes this event possible. And uh, creativity also takes uh, you know shape in the promotional materials that you get on your, on your chairs, all the graphics and, and the posts that we create uh, to reach the community and to actually keep us connected. Uh, artistic expressions of you know the, the artists that put together those illustrations, the themed illustrated uh, every every month. You know those are things that are actually. Um, incredible expressions of, of, of generosity. So we also have amazing presenters, not, you know, excluding me, but, <laughs> but we have fantastic musical guests now, and that is just, you know, blowing us away in different and unexpected ways every single time. So all those cool and new expressions of creativity, I think, uh, you know, that happens as well with 30 second beaches or the partners' activations that sometimes get uh, at the breakfast area. Uh, all the questions and comments that we get from you, all these, you know, the top jokes, come on. Uh, that is, you know, something that is going to keep bringing us happiness and, and generosity abounded on it. So I could keep going on, you know, that, but I'm going to stop because I have so much more to say. I, I also think that um, we also get an abundance of knowledge in these spaces, right? There's a, a wealth of ideas, experiences, information, guidance, things that are from, you know, the master uh, skill expert uh, showcasing their craft uh, to humans showing vulnerability, resilience, or openness, right? So each of the presenters uh, on this stage has given us so much just by sharing 20 minutes of their, their story. And what we get out of every talk at each of the, you know, of those individuals uh, have different meanings for each of us, right? So it multiplies in different ways. And uh, all these presentations generate so many learnings and transformations that are, you know, it's really hard to count their impact and how much we get out of them. So, you know, because it's also the interactions between us after the talk that expands on that generosity. 
So um, I feel lucky to have experienced such a bounty of knowledge from the people on stage and from our audience here as well. So one thing I'm constantly in awe is the abundance of financial generosity and support that we get here. Um, every month, every partner, every financial supporter to Creative Mornings makes it possible for us to keep doing this and, uh, and keep this event completely free for our community. And of course, there should be a disclaimer saying that this is not free at all, right? Like, it's possible because the, their financial support is possible because local sustaining partners, generous venues like SFU, and other long-term local and global partners are behind it. And they are willing to support the creativity of our community, our mandate as an event, and if there is no clear return of investment, they're okay, right? They, they don't mind that, which is like mind-blowing, right? Like, whoa. Um, our partners believe in the magic and necessity of this community, and they are companies and individuals that really give a damn. And they lead with empathy, and as such, they are willing to support this generosity economy. So these magical individuals are not easy to find, as you might think. So if you or your company are feeling abundant, let's talk. <laughs> Anyway, what can I say about the abundance of love and friendship that I get from this uh, community? Uh, we each get, an every, you know, each and every time we get here, I see this room full of energized, creative people and the amount of connections and friendships and partnerships and even families that have been built here and keeps growing as we speak is ridiculous, right? So I have experienced that, uh, what it means to make a new friend every month. Uh, how to get the best hugs um, and high fives from sometimes even complete strangers uh, that turns into close friends right after. <laughs> and they're actually willing to share by turning their, their chair uh, personal experiences and, and things that are just very personal for just the theme of the month. So uh, to meet people outside Creative Morning sometimes recognizing me for that time that I check them into the room you know, or when I gave them a postcard or, you know, said, wave goodbye to somebody. It's kind of fun to have that. So in this community, I have made friends for life. Acquaintances that I can reach out for partnerships, for conversations, for expertise and, and, and a helping hand. Uh, but what an amazing feeling it is to get the abundance of all of these big-hearted humans coming each month to experience community and connection and meet these kindred uh, people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in our neighborhoods and cities around the world. Yeah, I know, right? Like I'm <laughs> One thing that blows my mind is that all of these examples of abundance are then multiplied across the globe on every each, you know, every one of those chapters that we saw, the 200 and actually have 226 chapters. I don't know if that's true. So uh, knowing this gives me hope that all the abundance I experience each month um, is resonating across the world and with much more impact than I can even imagine. So in this particular moment um, in history, when we're living with so much hardship and despair, isn't it encouraging to think that we are part of this unselfish project that started 14 years ago with one small but generous idea? And I hope that the takeaway from this presentation is that abundance can live in the smallest of forms. Uh, so if we lead with abundance, hard work, and a bit of heart, I believe everyone, every one of us can actually shape a better creative future. Thanks. When I agreed to do this, I didn't realize I was going to be following two university professors. So. Bear with me here. Um, but um, my little bit working? Oh no, I had a cute little pug that waved at you. Anyways, hi. Um, my name is Heidi, Heidi Christine. Um, it's kind of weird being up here and usually sitting at the back creating content for our social platforms. But uh, I've been working with the, or volunteering with the Q uh, Vancouver chapter here for about a year, which is wild. This year has flown by. Um, and it would really be a missed opportunity if I didn't make you all get your phones out and follow one of our social accounts. So, get your phones out, I'm dead serious, get your phones out and follow us. Um, 
And while you do that, I'm also going to ask you a question. Who here thinks life ends when you turn 30? Anyone? No? All right, well, let me tell you about a conversation I had recently. I was chatting with a friend, and he is 26, and he told me that life ends when you turn 30. Now, I'm 27, and I do not believe this. I think that's ridiculous. Um, but it's a very common theme that we hear, right? You turn 29 forever. So, I have another question for you. Who thinks life is short? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, I want to talk to you all about time and how I have kind of found a way to create the feeling of having an abundance of time in my life. And I'm going to kind of chat about three different things that led me here. So, first of all, as I stated previously, I am an engineer. So my scientific brain is like, I know for a fact that time is rel relative. Time is relative. It is literally not constant. That is the formula that proves it. And although I would love to dive into physics with you all today, we are not going to. But keep this in mind, time is perceptive. So how do we create an abundance of time? It's kind of conceptual. Well, I started to notice that there, there are moments where you don't feel like you have an abundance of time versus ones where you do. And through these moments, for me, it's come down to one thing, presence. How present am I in that moment? So this is my second point. But I'm going to set the scene a little bit for why I've come to this conclusion. So I grew up here on the North Shore, and I attended a school that prides itself on having four pillars. We have academics, arts, athletics, and uh, service. And I excelled in all of them. I didn't really care for service, which was all about volunteering, but I would say that I'm making up for it right now. Okay. Um, I lived a very balanced life because of this. When it came to university, did not even consider the arts because who does, right? And I studied electrical engineering. Um, and if you look closely at my shirt, it says engineering ruined my life, um, which I was very proud to get my hands on because it was a hot commodity at the engineering school in Calgary. My entire life was school. I woke up early, I went to classes, I went to labs, I studied, I came home, I studied more, I did homework, and I did have a social life as well. But that was, that was it. It was school and then my social life. It wasn't until the summer after my third year that I started to feel like empty, unsatisfied, unfulfilled. I was super busy. I was so busy. I was doing so much, and I still felt this way. I started scrolling through Instagram, as you do, and I saw people painting abstract art. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's going to solve all my problems. I need to paint abstract art. So I did a little bit. I picked up some supplies from Michaels and Walmart, and, and I did. Nothing too serious. After university, I moved back to Vancouver and I started working at a software company. Um, I managed the deployment of our uh, product at new grocery sites or uh, distribution centers. Very niche, I know. Uh, and I was there for two and a half years um, and I was working very closely with clients. And yes, that's a picture of me in an enormous shopping cart in the Valley of California. It was pretty cool. We saw it and I was like, can I, can I go in there? Uh, here are some pieces I was working on throughout this period of my life. I was also painting abstract art. And this, these moments were the first time I really started to understand or even perceive presence. I would almost crave it. I would come home after work, I would set up at my desk, I'd have my laptop, Vampire Diaries was playing next to me, and I would just paint. It didn't even matter what I was painting, I would just do it. You know, after the fact, people would often ask me, oh, what were you feeling when you painted this? It's like, I don't know, it was season two, episode three, like, it was, I was just there in the moment. Time stood still. 
Time didn't matter. But I was doing this in the evening, exhausted after work. And after a while, I realized this is not cutting it. I need these moments in my career as well. I need to do this during the day. I don't want to count hours. I want time to disappear. So in February 2020, I quit my job. Really good timing, I know. And I, as I said, I was uh, working closely with a lot of clients. And so I reached out to the ones that I had been working closely with and I let them know I was moving on. Most of them were lovely, said, you know, really kind things. Hope I see you again in the future. Good luck, all those sorts of things. Except one. One responded to me saying things like, wow, I hope that was your choice. It was. Um, you're so brave. I've worked in the same job at the same company for over 30 years, since I was 19. And I was taken aback by this comment for two reasons. A part of it sounded like he was being rude and maybe jealous, which is where I started to feel really empathetic. I can't imagine doing the same thing for over 30 years. And I was like 24 or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. But this is one of those moments, like I mentioned before, where you determine how you're perceiving time. There are moments where you feel like you don't have an abundance of time. And I thought, maybe I'm onto something. Because when we compare the conversation that I had with my 26-year-old friend to this 50-something-year-old client, it really proves that it doesn't matter how old you are, it just all comes down to it what makes life feel abundant to you. So, over the next couple years, I learned tons of new skills freelancing from graphic design to podcast editing. I worked closely with a team of women, which was truly magical after working in a male-dominated industry for over a decade. And that led me to where I am now, volunteering with Creative Mornings, and then I'm also the CMO and head of community for a gaming startup based in Web3. And if that is all gibberish, think marketing for like Farmville that's blockchain backed. <laughs> so, my last point. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be a joke, but I'm glad it was. <laughs> my last point I want to make here is that how you perceive time and abundance is a very personal experience, and I've shared with you all, shared with you all my path to finding it through being present and, and creative work. But this saying, time flies while you're having fun, isn't really applicable to me and my experiences. And that's okay. So, I know this has been quite conceptual, but I truly think that creating an abundance of time is a very unique experience. So, just to recap, point one, my scientific brain, time literally isn't constant. Perceive it how you want to. Two, for me, I found activities and tasks, moments where I felt the most present, where time stood still. And three, just ignore popular opinions and find out for yourself. Thank you.